Lab Guy here. Today we're going to look at the narrowband TV signal. This format is 32 lines, mechanically scanned, usually with a NIPCAO disc. I will be duplicating the NBTV Club uh, televisor. I'm using an old LP for my scanning disc. I, it's hand drilled. So uh, it should have all of the uh, flaws that a normal narrowband TV first attempt will have. But first, let's go ahead and look at the signal on the scope. What I want to show you is that the video signal is rather conventional and that the video uh, sig portion of the signal goes positive and the sync tips go negative and that the way they do vertical sync, which is the once around rotation pulse of the NIPCAO disc, is done by leaving out one of the horizontal, horizontal sync pulses. And in fact, let's switch to the vernacular of the club. They have uh, line and frame. The once around pulse would be called frame, and the individual uh, scanning holes are called the lines. And they I'm using the uh, Aurora Designs World Converter for my signal source. It is a, a video based device that can produce a, a dozen or two obsolete video standards. Everything from something like 20 line mechanical television all the way up to uh, 405 line CBS color, 525 Dumont color. Uh, 525 uh, CBS color, those would be field sequential color systems. And so the output uh, DACs in that device are designed to output 1 volt peak to peak into a 75 ohm termination. In narrowband television work, it's quite common to use the output of audio devices because the 32 line signal has audio bandwidth of about 10 kilohertz. So many of the club members record their, vid their video on the uh, sound capture uh, part of their computer using their sound cards or even uh, real to real tape recorders and cassette tape recorders. Um, when doing this, you want to record in WAV file format, uncompressed. Um, the compressed audio um, MP3 format uh, causes too much distortion to the signal for it to work very well. So let's look at a scope shot now of the uh, video signal as I've captured it on the oscilloscope. Now I've triggered the scope so that at the very beginning of the uh, scan on the left side you can see the missing sync pulse. That is the pulse at the bottom which I highlight now. and then the rest of the sync is in this highlight. The way I have the scope triggered now, we're looking at less than one frame. Uh, it's just the way the scope triggered on this. So you could see the missing sync pulse. Now using some uh, one shots uh, after the sync is separated, uh, we can detect that missing pulse. Many of the schemes actually look at the 31 sync pulse train with the gap and compare it with the pulses produced by sinkholes that are drilled through the scanning disk itself and they are also drilled 31 holes and a gap so really the two sink streams are the same um, I don't know how they achieve phasing uh, of the frame yet that would be uh, it, it's actually this way the centering of the crossover line in the frame on the picture, but we're going to discover that as we proceed. So uh, let's look at the club uh, video circuit going from the video input to the DC restorer, the sync separator, and the LED driver. Looking at the, their circuit, you see the video comes in on the left side into RV1, a 10K pot. It's AC coupled and it goes to IC1A which is set up as a black clipper. So this will force 
the DC, the bottom DC level of the signal, that is the very bottom of the sink tips, to zero volts. The positive input of IC1A is tied to ground, which is zero volts, and that is the reference. The diode on the output D1, on the output of the op amp, feeds back the DC, and you'll note that that sets the DC on the right hand plate of C2 which is located next to the potentiometer. Above that, IC1B is the sink separator. You will see that it is set up with R1 and R2 producing a 66 millivolt reference. That is applied to the positive input. The, the video is applied to the negative input on pin 6 and the Op amp is configured as a comparator. The 1 meg resistor, R4, forms a positive feedback loop which speeds up the response so that it slices sync pulses just above zero volts. The voltage reference is 66 millivolts. So as soon as the sync tip is 66 millivolts or higher, the output of the op amp will switch on and produce a pulse for that period. The video portion is completely ignored. Moving on to IC2. IC2 is set up as a general purpose amplifier, driving the input of the power FET, uh, the IRF510. There is a feedback loop going from RV3 back to the negative input of IC2. The output of IC2 is divided by 2 by R5 and R6 with an additional 10 nanofarad capacitor C4 placed across R5 as a high frequency boost. This is compensating for the high gate capacitance of the IRF510. In addition to the 1K and 470 resistors forming the negative feedback loop, there is a 33 ohm, a 15 ohm, and a, a 12 ohm diode, uh, resistor, and the, the latter two, RB and RC, with diodes attached. These are forming a gamma correction curve in that amplifier. It is my opinion that this is the wrong place to be performing gamma correction because gamma correction is done properly in a video system at the source such as in a camera or a scanner whatever your source is. I'm using the world converter which takes a video input from a video camera and the video camera has already performed the gamma function to the signal. So now let's look at my version of this circuit you'll notice that I have the same 10K input pot coming into a coupling capacitor to the DC restore which I have redrawn so that it makes sense. Then it drives my video amplifier which is very similar to the one shown in the club circuit but my video amp drives a, a bipolar transistor and the combination of the transistor, the op amp, and the I set resistor form a linear amplifier that converts voltage to current. The I set resistor is chosen so that the input voltage at the top of the input pot determines the output current to the LEDs. LEDs are linear in the current domain. If I double the current, I double the light for the most part until the LED saturates. Above that point it simply overheats and eventually fails. Note that the resistor values I give, a 5 ohm resistor will give me 100 milliamps into my LEDs if the pot was dialed all the way to the top. So um, by selecting the I set resistor, we can set the top current for peak 1 volt in to give us whatever maximum current we want for our LEDs. 
that summarizes my version of the circuit. My sink separator currently is their sink separator. Uh, I'll go ahead and use that until I determine that perhaps it uh, needs improvement because I'm not real happy with it being on that side of the level control. But perhaps that makes sense when you have unreliable sources where the where the voltage waveform coming from your source, like an audio playback device, uh, can be anywhere from a tenth of a volt to three volts. You don't know until, until you see it. It's also, as far as I'm concerned, not properly terminated. I'm a real advocate for 75 ohm drive, 75 ohm termination, and calibrated one volt signals. Now I understand that using sound cards doesn't give you that luxury. So that summarizes my approach to the uh, narrowband TV project so far. We've looked at the signal, the missing sync pulse uh, vertical sync, and discussed the club circuit versus my uh, first order circuit. Until I build it, we don't know if anything works. And uh, so stay tuned for that. If you liked this video and found it useful, give me a thumbs up. And if you know anyone who likes mechanical television or video in general and would like to learn about video circuitry, definitely recommend the channel to them. And uh, until next time, Lab Guy out.